Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the 143rd Annual General Meeting of the Chartered Institute of Bankers in Scotland. I confirm that a quorum is present and that the Annual General Meeting may proceed. A warm welcome to fellow Council members, fellows and members here in person in Edinburgh and also to members joining us uh, on our live webcast across the UK and around the world. A very warm welcome. Hopefully you'll see this as a very practical demonstration of the UK and international growth of our institute and our professional community in recent years. Let me move swiftly on to today's agenda. Item 1, the minutes of the 142nd Annual General Meeting. I propose that the minutes of the 142nd Annual General Meeting, as printed in the August 2017 edition of Chartered Banker, the Institute's magazine, be taken as read. I see no one seeking any questions on that, so we will take them as read. Let me next follow on to my presidential address. Fellow council members, fellows, and members of the Chartered Institute of Bankers in Scotland, as you know, this institute is the oldest professional banking institute in the world. Founded in 1875, it has driven an agenda of ethical professionalism throughout its existence. Promoting pre professional standards for bankers, providing professional qualifications for retail, commercial and private bankers in the UK and overseas, and offering professional membership to qualified individuals. I am deeply honoured and proud to be president of this institute, an organisation I personally have been an active member of for nearly 40 years. I am greatly encouraged to see that the number of members joining the institute continues to grow. Last year saw member numbers increase, and as I speak to you today, this is now standing at 32,250. And I should point out this includes 8,623 student members from over 85 countries. At the end of 2017, there were 10,503 individuals studying for institute qualifications. And again, I'll just point out this excludes those studying with our university partners and 4,196 individuals completed an institute qualification during 2017. The institute continues to lead the professional banking standards agenda in the UK. We do this by campaigning for banks to invest further in building their colleague capability and thereby ensuring that the culture of prudence, professionalism and stewardship promoted by the institute is embedded in the way they do business. Our growing influence and impact in this area is reflected by the support we have received during the meetings I've had in the past year with both the chairman of the FCA and the chief executive of the PRA. Our influence is increasingly being recognised globally too, and I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Chris Whitehead, the chief executive of the Financial Services Institute of Australasia, FINSEA, to this evening's AGM and to pay tribute to him and his colleagues for their achievements over the past year. So Chris, do you want to just put your hand up? Welcome. It's very, very good to see you here this evening. In October 2017, I visited Australia and New Zealand to meet with Chris and his team. While there, we met with several senior bankers, regulators and media representatives. The visit turned out to be a very timely one, as it, I'm sure you've seen in the press, at the end of last year, the Australian Government set up a Royal Commission on Banking. Although Chris has assured me that this was more due to public pressure than to the effect of my personal visit. The Royal Commission has been set up to investigate whether any of the providers of Australia's financial services have been engaged in misconduct. And it has given added impetus to the work we were already undertaking with FINSEA namely adapting our internationally recognised chartered banker qualifications for the Australian market, while also supporting them to develop a standards board similar to our own chartered banker professional standards board in Australia. Chris, we look forward to continuing our successful partnership over the coming years. Another important development in 2017 was the launch of the Chartered Body Alliance with our counterparts at the Chartered Insurance Institute, and the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investments. The initial focus of the Alliance has been a joint marketing campaign to promote chartered status. 
to financial services professionals and to the public in the UK. The Alliance has subsequently issued several joint press releases, regulatory responses and held joint events, including a very well attended and very insightful event on the ethics of artificial intelligence with Anthony Jenkins. Ethics being a subject we will hear more about later this evening from our guest speaker, Philippa foster Back, Director of the Institute of Business Ethics. Although well known as a former Barclays Bank CEO, Anthony Jenkins is also Chair of the Institute for Apprenticeships. And we were delighted to welcome him in that capacity to give the keynote speech at our Banking Education Conference in, November, in London last November. The Institute has continued to build its influence in apprenticeships over the past year by enhancing our role as one of the select group of professional bodies to be granted endpoint assessment status for apprenticeships in England and completing the suite of financial service apprenticeship standards linked to the Chartered Banker Institute qualifications. A key priority now and going forward is to develop the Institute's thought leadership on the future of banking. This will consider the changing nature of the banking profession in the digital era, the ethical issues involved in increasing use of technology in banking, and the impact on skills, expertise, and professional judgment of future bankers. As mentioned earlier, I am looking forward to hearing Philippa's insights into the challenges of ethics in the digital age. Another important aspect of our future of banking agenda is encouraging and supporting young bankers of the future. I was delighted that 2017 saw the launch of a new initiative by the Institute, the Chartered Banker 2025 Foundation. Established in anticipation of the Institute's 150th anniversary in 2025, the Foundation is aligned with the original aims of the Institute, namely the promotion of education and development of young bankers entering the profession. The 2025 Foundation was formally launched by Governor Mark Carney at the Bank of England in London last autumn. And this was followed by a Scottish launch in Edinburgh in March 2018, where Andrew Bailey, Chief Executive of the Financial Conduct Authority, kindly provided the keynote speech. The Foundation aims to raise £1 million by 2025 to identify and support talented young people who will benefit from financial and other help to pursue a career in banking and has already achieved 20% of the million pound target. I know that many fellows and members here tonight have already generously contributed to the foundation and thank you for your very generous contributions. For those of you yet to do so, I would urge you to actively support this initiative as you will be playing a key role in changing the life of a talented young person. Still on the, uh, the subject of the future of banking, our, young, our UK Young Banker of the Year competition celebrated its 30th anniversary, with an exciting final taking place at Mansion House in London last September. Now, some of you, I think, in this room have memories long enough. As a former Young Banker of the Year myself, the competition has a special resonance for me, as you might expect. This year's winner was Joanna Finlay from Virgin Money. Joanna's idea was to provide a simple, practical solution to help unbanked people prove where they live, which sounds a very simple thing, but actually was one of those gaps that she had identified from her work. And by doing so and providing that practical solution, they gain access to banking services. Her presentation in the view of the judges demonstrated originality and the development of a socially purposeful banking that customers and communities expect. She proved a very worthy winner, and who knows, Hopefully, she will go on to become Institute President in a few years. Looking to the year ahead, let me highlight just three more of the many initiatives we have planned. Firstly, we have recently introduced Chartered Banker by Experience for existing experienced banking professionals who wish to gain Chartered Banker status and become members of the Chartered Banker Institute. Secondly, at the Guildhall in London, we will be launching our Green Finance Certificate to develop financial services professionals' knowledge of the science behind and the principles and practice of green finance. And thirdly, in October, we will launch a substantially redesigned Chartered Banker Diploma, which helps learners develop both core banking skills 
and an understanding of technology to give them the professional knowledge and skills required to succeed for themselves, their customers and their banks in the digital age. So I hope I've given you a flavour of the wide variety of activities the Institute has been involved in over the past year and our plans for the forthcoming year. If you wish to know more, then I encourage you to read this year's annual report. This has been a considerable year of achievements and continued growth for the, growth for the Institute. And I hope you'll agree with me that the Institute is having an ever-increasing impact and influence. On behalf of Council, I wish to congratulate Simon and the Institute staff and our growing range of partners for their continued hard work and dedication. The role of Council and Institute com uh, committees is equally important though, and in setting the direction and strategy for the Institute, it's, it's, sorry, it's equally important in setting the direction and strategy for the Institute, and I must pay tribute to my colleagues on Council, our other committees, the Vice Presidents, and the Executive Committee for ensuring over the past year your institute remains true to our core values and mission. I especially wish to thank all of my council colleagues for the enormous support they have so generously given me during my year as institute president. Thank you to you all. Before I conclude my remarks, it is appropriate that we recognise the substantial contribution to the institute and council made by three members of council who are stepping down today. And they are Kevin Page, Hamish Bogue, and Rob McElroy. Kevin, Hamish, and Rob, I wish to sincerely thank each of you on behalf of all the fellows and members of the Institute for your service and contribution during your time. Rob, I see you here tonight, and if I could just ask you just to join me briefly, I have a small gift I'd like to give you for your service to the Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. And finally, thank you too to all our fellows and members who gave up their time, expertise and experience to support the Institute during the course of the last year. I look forward to another year of success in 2018-2019, a year that, as we will hear later, will, with royal assent, see us reconstitute ourselves as the Chartered Banker Institute. Thank you. Thank you for your kind applause. Um, I will now turn to the formal part of our meeting. The resolutions to be put to the members this evening appear in the notice of meeting, which was published in accordance with our charter and rules. Item three, you will see, we will now consider the Institute's annual report for 2017-2018, our report summarises 12 months of continued growth in our impact and influence, both here in the UK and internationally, as I covered in my address a few moments ago. We have some hard copies available uh, here today, and the full annual report, together with our annual accounts, is available to all members on the Institute's website. The annual report has been considered by the Audit Committee and Council, and is recommended by Council for adoption at the AGM. If you have any questions on the report, let me ask you to please ask them now. I, um, speaking no questions, I now propose the adoption of the annual report and would ask those in favour to raise their hands. Thank you. Would those against please raise their hands? I confirm that the annual report for 2017-2018 is adopted. I'll move on to item four, the submission of the accounts. We'll now consider the accounts for the year to 28th February 2018 and our uh, <coughs> auditor's report from Sheen and Tate. As I mentioned a moment ago, the accounts are available to all members via the Institute website. As with their annual report, the accounts have been considered by the Audit Committee and Council and are recommended by Council for adoption. If you have any questions on the accounts or auditor's report, can I ask you to please ask them now? Seeing no questions, I now propose the adoption of the accounts and would ask those in favour to raise their hands. Thank you all. Would those against please raise their hands? Thank you. I confirm that the accounts for the year to 28th February 2018 are adopted. Item 5. 
will now deal with the appointment of our auditor for 2018-2019. The Audit Committee and Council propose the reappointment of Sheeran Tate as auditor and, would, and I ask those in favour to raise their hands. Thank you. Any, uh, those, uh, would those against please raise their hands? And I confirm that Shane and Tate is reappointed as auditor for 2018-2019. Thank you. I'm about to move on in a moment to the election of council members and office bearers um, in item six. Um, but before I do so, I thought I'd like to note for the benefit of members here in the AGM and on our webcast, uh, that this is anticipated to be the final occasion on which we will elect members to the current council. As you'll remember, following a governance review established in 2015, at last year's AGM we approved a draft new Royal Charter that was submitted earlier this year to the Privy Council for their approval. At this time, we are hopeful that this could be formally approved by this autumn. Our new Royal Charter will re-establish us as the Chartered Banker Institute, with a new and smaller Board of Trustees replacing Council this time next year. Under item 10 in today's agenda, I'll ask Simon, our Chief Executive, to summarise the Charter and governance changes. But at this point, I felt it was worth pointing out that in anticipation of this transition to a smaller Board, we do not intend to replace some members of council whose terms have expired. So you will note that uh, here that there are fewer elections than usual this year. With that said, let us now turn to the election of council representatives. In all cases, for 12 months only, as we prepare to receive our new Royal Charter and establish our new Board of Trustees. I can confirm that in all cases, the, nomination for election set, the nominations for election set out in the notice of meeting have been considered and approved by the Institute's nominations committee. So, let me move on to item six. There are three nominations for election to council as fellows representatives. There are no member or district centre representatives due for re-election this year. Or for re-election this year. All three fellows are currently members of council and play key roles as office bearers and chairs of committees. They are Kerry Faulkner, Steve Pateman and Ian Hardcastle. Do I have a proposer for these three? Thank you, Hugh. Do I have a seconder? Robin, thank you very much. Can I now ask those in favour to raise their hands? Thank you very much. Would those against please raise their hands? Thank you. I confirm the elections of Kerry, Steve and Ian to Council for a period of 12 months. It's useful at this stage just to also uh, discuss the subject of lay members. The Institute's rules state that Council shall include two or more lay voting members <coughs> who are not members of the Institute, meeting criteria set out by Council and recruited by open selection. As a result, lay members do not require to be elected at this meeting. I am, however, delighted to confirm that Susan Younger, who chairs the, the, the Institute's Quality and Standards Committee, has been reappointed for a further 12 months. I'll now move on to item seven, the election of president for 2018 and 2019. So it's now time for me to vacate the chair and hand over to Simon to oversee the election of President. Simon. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, sir, fellows and members. The re-election of Robert Dickey, our current president, for a further 12-month term has been considered and approved by the Institute's Nominations Committee. Do we have a proposer? Gary, thank you very much. Do we have a seconder? Great, Kerry, David, thank you very much. So I'd now like to ask all those who support the re-election of Robert as president for a further 12 months to raise their hands. Thank you. And would anyone against who's brave enough please raise their hands? <laughs> <laughs> Great, so I'm very pleased to confirm, Robert, you've been re-elected as president. And I would ask you to take the chair, except it's a lectern in this case. So <laughs> congratulations. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate that. Thank you, Simon, uh, for so ab uh, ably um, stepping in. Item eight, the election of senior vice president. We'll now consider the election of a senior vice president for the next 12 months. The re-election of our current senior vice president, Bill McCall, um, has been considered and approved by nominations committee. Do we have a proposer? Robin, thank you so much. Do we have a seconder? William, thank you so much. I now ask those who support the election of Bill McCall as senior vice president to raise their hands. Thank you very much. Would those against please raise their hands? <coughs> Thank you very much. I confirm that Bill is elected as Senior Vice President for 2018-2019. Item nine, the election of Vice Presidents. We'll now consider the election of Vice Presidents for the year ahead. The re-election of our current Vice Presidents, Kerry Falconer and Steve Pateman, has been considered and approved by the Nominations Committee. Do we have a proposer? Bill, thank you. Do we have a seconder? Thank you very much. I now ask those in favour of the re-election of Kerry Faulkner um, and Steve Pateman as Vice Presidents for 2018-19 to raise their hands. Thank you very much. Would those against please raise their hands? Thank you very much. I confirm that Kerry and Steve are re-elected as Vice Presidents for 2018 and 2019. We'll now move to item 10, um, governance changes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're hopeful of receiving our new Royal Charter this autumn, recognising our growth and emergence as the UK-wide professional body for bankers. Let me be very clear again for those attending the AGM and on the webcast, there is no need for us to approve any further governance changes this year. But I thought it would be helpful to remind members of the rationale for and benefits of the changes which will come into effect this time next year. And to summarise those changes and the timescale for their implementation, I will now hand back to Simon, our Chief Executive, to take us through a summary of the expected changes. Simon. Great. Thank you, Robert. So I hope all our fellows and members will recall last year's AGM when we agreed a draft new Royal Charter for submission to the Privy Council. And as well as some general modernisation to bring our rules and regulations uh, up to date, as our existing charter dated from 1976, there were four main changes proposed and agreed. The first was to formally rename our institute as the Chartered Banker Institute, thereby making our existing trading name, which we've used very successfully for the past eight years, the Institute's legal name, although we will retain the Chartered Institute of Bankers in Scotland name and the CIOBS name and trademarks too for use here in Scotland and perhaps elsewhere where necessary. Uh, the second change associated with that means that the uh, designatory letters currently provided for by the rules will will change to reflect that, so they'll go from FCIBS and MCIBS to FCBI and MCBI. We lose the S from the end. Um, the third major change is to replace our existing council with a smaller board of trustees, as, as Robert mentioned earlier, um, which will comprise, as now, uh, uh, of a mix of both member trustees and independent trustees. We're using the trustee word just to stress that um, we are we will remain an educational charity and council members now are trustees. We don't use that word except in sort of formal submissions to Oscar. So we just thought by having a, a board of trustees, it would make that relationship clearer. And fourthly, and very importantly, we're establishing a new membership forum to provide an opportunity for a much larger and more diverse group of members to get involved in the governance and strategic direction of the Institute without requiring the very significant time commitment that being on council as it is now, or the board as it will be in the future, uh, will, will require. So those are the four main changes we, we agreed. Um, working with our lawyers after last year's AGM, we drafted a petition for a supplementary charter to go before the or committee of the Privy Council. On the 24th of April, um, th that petition was approved by Her Majesty, meaning that our plans will be published in the London and Edinburgh Gazettes, um, which gives others who may object to our our proposals uh, a chance to object to that. Uh, petitions against closed on Tuesday, 
uh, there were no petitions received, which means everything is now proceeding uh, uh, as we'd expected. Um, it goes to the Attorney General's office and we expect our new supplementary charter to be approved later this summer or in early autumn. And that'll be the, the, the formal process of getting a new charter completed. Um, once that charter is approved, we'll begin to formally implement the changes, although work has already started behind the scenes on this. The new Board of Trustees, which will replace Council, will take office uh, this time next year at the AGM. In the time between the approval of our new charter and that AGM, existing Council members will continue as a transitional Council. As Robert mentioned earlier, we've um, uh, let Council reduce in size in anticipation of the smaller Board of Trustees coming into effect. This autumn, we will begin the recruitment of board members or trustees and membership forum members and we've increased our nominations committee this year in size to help with this and the interview process involved. Uh, Robert and I and all of the current council would like to encourage as many members as possible uh, from as many parts of the institute as possible to consider getting involved either as a trustee or on the membership forum. We want the forum in particular to reflect the broad diversity of our large and growing membership as much as we can. So we'll be promoting this quite heavily as an institute, but please do consider applying and please do encourage colleagues and friends to get involved in the institute too. Uh, finally, there will be regular communication about this uh, beginning in the autumn and then refresh at the start of next year. About what, the change, about what the changes are, what's happening, and in particular what they mean for our members. And the key messages to take away, I think, are two. Firstly, the name change establishes us unequivocally as the professional body for bankers in the UK um, and will help support our continued international growth. And secondly, our modernised governance arrangements will streamline decision making whilst allowing a much more diverse range of members to get involved in the strategy and direction of the Institute than is currently the case. So um, uh, I think we did a very good job last year in approving all those changes. I'd like to pay tribute to uh, my colleagues on council, particularly those involved in the governance group uh, that did all the thinking behind this over a two year period and to my colleagues past and present um, who've done a lot of work behind the scenes in getting us to this stage. Robert, thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, I hope you get a sense there has been a considerable amount of work over the last couple of years to get to this stage. And um, please be assured that we are quite aware there's a considerable amount of work to go on before we meet again this time next year at the AGM as we start to reconstitute ourselves. Uh, but let me just reinforce what Simon said and to encourage everyone here in Edinburgh today and for everyone on the webcast, please come forward and get engaged. We truly are seeking the most diverse group of folks to become part of our new governance procedures. So I warmly encourage you to come forward and uh, seek to be a part of uh, uh, the Institute's governing groups. So th um, thank you, Simon. Um, as there are no proposed changes to membership subscriptions uh, this year, we now turn to any other business, item 11. Let me just look in the room and see if there is any other business that anyone would like to raise. Seeing nothing. Okay. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes the business of the 143rd Annual General Meeting of the Chartered Institute of Bankers in Scotland. And I look forward to seeing you again this time next year for what will be our first meeting as the Chartered Banker Institute. Thank you very much. <laughs>